Excellent. Hello friends and welcome to Probing Paul. This is episode number 40. It is my Q&A video. I answer the questions that you guys ask of me. So all the questions I'm answering this month were asked in last month's Probing Paul. So if you want me to answer your questions next month, then post those down in the comment section down below. Last month was episode 39 and there's a look at all the old Probing Pauls from all the times I have been probed in the past. And there's a playlist if you guys want to check it out and see other questions that I responded to. All the questions I'm answering today are also linked down there with timestamps. If you guys want to check them out, that said, let us move into the first probing. Question was asked by Stephen Mason. Hey Paul, not sure if this is the best place to ask, but can I reuse an SSD that has Windows 10 on it for a brand new build so I don't have to rebuy Windows? So I'm going to answer your question in two parts. Uh, first part of the question is, can you take an SSD that already has Windows 10 installed on it and reuse it in a new system? And the answer there is yes. My uh, hesitation there would be to make sure that everything is wiped off that drive if you have any personal information, depending on whether you're using the new system yourself or whether you're putting it into a system to hand off to somebody else or to resell. If you are doing that and you're at all concerned about security, you want to make sure you do a secure erase on the drive. That's uh, something that's specific to SSDs. The method I use most often is just a secure erase function that is built into the UEFI of most current generation ASUS motherboards. That will completely erase the drive and make sure that no data is on it. And then you can install it in the new system, do a clean install of Windows on it. Second part of your question is, can you take that Windows 10 installation from an existing computer and move it to a new computer and not wipe the drive, just use the Windows 10 that's already on there? The answer is yes, you can, but there are some things you wanna keep in mind. First off, I don't like to do that. I usually like to go with a clean, fresh install of Windows from scratch if I'm doing a new build, but Windows 10 is a little bit more flexible than older versions of Windows, so if you do that, it should be able to recognize the hardware that's in there, use Windows Update to download drivers, and you should be able to get the system up and running functionally. Loading up into Windows 10 though is not the same as having Windows 10 activated and whether or not Windows 10 will activate on that completely new computer that you've moved the drive to will depend on how it was originally activated. For that, there is a website about activating Windows 10 and the various methods of doing that. You can activate Windows, Windows directly to the hardware, which usually is tied to the motherboard of the installation, or you can actually link it to your Microsoft account. I usually activate Windows 10 licenses to the motherboard because I use lots of different computers, but if you typically only use one, you can tie your Windows 10 activation to your Microsoft account, and then you can just log into the new system with your Microsoft account, and then you should be able to use your version of Windows. The only real difference there would be that your Windows 10 license is activated to you and your Microsoft account versus the PC and the hardware. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better explanation, but I will reiterate, if you are taking any old storage device, whether you're talking about an SSD or an old mechanical hard drive, do bear in mind that you should make sure all of the data is wiped before you pass that hardware on and for spinning mechanical hard drives that's why I, I don't even bother to try that I just destroy them but for SSDs secure erase is actually a pretty secure way of erasing your data I wonder if that's why they call it secure erase Next question from TweakedOU812. Uh, just curious why uh, when me or Linus or Jay or Kyle or Lyle build PCs, we never add the operating system? This is a good question, one that's definitely been brought up before and one that I've somewhat apologized for in past attempts at making good tutorial videos that are thorough and take you entirely through the process. What I usually do these days when I'm making a tutorial video on how to build a computer is I start with going over the hardware, I do the build, and then I have this part three which is system setup. I've actually done quite a few system setup videos now. I did this one from about a year ago that has uh, well over a million views, so that's pretty nice too. Either of those should take you through the process. This one's a little bit shorter and more direct. The other one is a little bit more thorough. So that's, I guess that's the answer to your question is I have system setup videos that take you from, here's a computer I just put together through uh, installing Windows, updating drivers, uh, updating your UEFI BIOS if necessary, getting the system from just built to actual functional and up and running, but if you if I did that for every single build video, it would make the build videos very long, and the process of doing that is pretty standard, uh, even if you're using different hardware or even if you're using AMD or Intel, for example. So check out these videos. I'll link the uh, playlist in the video description, My Beginner's Guide to Building a Gaming PC, and that should hopefully take you from any of the builds I've done in the past through the system setup process. As for Linus and Kyle and all them, I assume they've never done anything like this because they suck. Next question here from 7virus7. Could I use 3200 megahertz RAM to run my R5 3600? It's not the sweet spot, but 
but it is the bare minimum and I lose like five FPS rate. So there's lots of questions when it comes to Ryzen and memory because Ryzen tends to like faster memory and with first and second gen, we were always recommending 3000 speed or 3200 speed. Now that third gen is out, it likes 3600 speed and that is viewed as the sweet spot for Ryzen memory. That said though, there are other factors to take into consideration here. The short answer for you here is that you're just fine. 3200 megahertz speed memory with a Ryzen 5 3600 is totally fine. And yes, you're looking at a very marginal difference if you were comparing uh, FPS in different games or other tasks you might do with your computer. That said, I will link this video in the description, uh, which is a recent video from our good friend Steve over at Gamers Nexus Tech Jesus, where they tested a bunch of different memory and a bunch of different configurations to figure out what the actual difference is between them. Short answer is, if you're looking at something like Civilization VI, it's a very, very small difference. If you're looking at something like GTA V, uh, it might be a little bit more of a difference, but there's actually a couple things from this video that I think were key to point out. One is that it's not just the RAM speed that matters. You you can fight 3600 speed memory that's cast latency 20 or higher, or you can fight in 3600 speed memory that is cast latency 16 or even 14. The lower the cast latency, the better. That's just a general rule. And then the other thing that Steve pointed out is that if you look at your motherboard's QVL list, that's the qualified vendor list for memory, that is the memory that the vendor of your motherboard, whether it's Gigabyte or Asus or ASRock, has gone and tested. And if they've tested it, it means they've also probably put a profile in your UEFI BIOS for that specific memory kit. What's Steve found was that even if you're using memory that's rated really well, if it's not on that QVL list, the motherboard might be going with default settings that are a lot looser, that don't get you as good of performance as memory that is on the QVL list. I'm saying list, list uh, over and over again, but you guys have to forgive me for that. All that is to say, if you really wanna get the most out of your memory, it's worth it to either make sure you have memory from that list or to go in and do some of the tweaking and tuning settings that I'm not gonna get into here, but Steve mentions in the video. So again, link to the description. Uh, they did a great job on this one and I'm happy that they did because they did a lot of testing and it uh, brought some new things to light, I think. Next question here from B6S4 Shelter. Uh, hey Paul, I'm buying a Samsung Q70R 65 inch 4K TV capable of 1440p at 120 FPS or Hertz with FreeSync down to 20 Hertz or at 4K it has a FreeSync range of 48 to 60 Hertz. What would be the right build for this couch gaming experience? What a what an awesome uh, display first off. Here it is over on Amazon currently selling for about $1,400 uh, but the Q70R 65 inch, uh, that, that's, a, that's a nice feature set whether you're talking about about, uh, viewing movies or playing video games. It is a VA panel as far as I understand. But more to your point, uh, what kind of build would pair up nicely with this? I'm gonna focus on the GPU because you have a lot of CPU options. I would say any Ryzen 3000 CPU, uh, 3600 or better, would be a nice pairing to go along with this monitor slash TV. Likewise, on the Intel side, you could go with a 9600K or better, I think uh, would be a great pairing on that side. And then beyond that, you're gonna wanna look at the games that you wanna play and what graphics card can get you good frame rate at 1440p. Uh, I have a recent video, which is my RTX 2080 Super Benchmarks, where I do do 1440 testing. So here you can see, for example, a game like Shadow of the Tomb Raider, if you're using the high preset, uh, it can only max out at about 140 FPS with an RTX 2080 Ti. That is with pretty high settings, but also if we jump over to GTA 5, we see the 2080 Ti is hitting about 156 average frames per second. 2080 Super is gonna get you more up into that 140-ish range, but you wanna make sure you're getting 120 FPS on average right ideally a bit beyond that to make sure that you're not dipping down too much. Although with FreeSync supports, uh, you will have a much better experience because even if it does dip below 120 FPS, it's just gonna change the refresh rate of the TV to match that. So all that said, I would point you towards a 2080 Ti if you can afford it, although those are very expensive, so I understand if you can't. Beyond that, a 2080 Super or a 2070 Super would probably be the best sort of combination of price around $500 and performance. Uh, you could also consider a 5700 or 5700 XT. You're not gonna get as many frames out of those cards, so you might need to adjust your game settings in order to hit those higher refresh rates or in order to get your FPS more towards 120. But the real nice thing here is that uh, Nvidia cards now work with FreeSync monitors, so you do have a lot more to choose from than you did say three or four months ago or whenever they made that change. Next question though is from Darth Snowman. He says, hey Paul, a huge fan. Thank you, Darth. Uh, do you think NVMe is necessary? No. It's not necessary, but it is 
nice. And the thing that I've been pointing out most recently when it comes to people who are choosing storage in particular is that you should be getting an SSD. You, you, you just should, at least if you're talking about your main operating system drive. And I would say even for like a games drive or something like that, prices have just come down so much that it's much more reasonable. And loading a game up off of an SSD, especially if there's lots of assets, is going to be a lot faster than loading it off of a spinning, spinning mechanical hard drive. But SSDs right now essentially come in two flavors. You have SATA SSDs, which are usually going to be uh, shipped in this form factor a 2.5 inch drive with a separate plug for power and one for data that routes over to your motherboard. Uh, you can also find M.2 drives that are still SATA, so watch out for those. But then you have M.2 drives like this, that's the form factor, that are NVMe. NVMe is a newer protocol for communicating between a drive and the rest of your system that is updated, that doesn't have some of the drawbacks and setbacks that SATA was hampered with, because SATA was designed to also handle spinning mechanical hard drives. NVMe is just better overall, and I'm not going to explain you all the reasons why, but when it comes to gaming in particular, although you're not going to get better frame rates with a NVMe SSD, you will potentially get faster load times, and then when it comes to loading your operating system onto an, NV an NVMe SSD, you'll often find that boot times are faster, and that's convenient for a lot of people. So in the past, I would tell people, you know, you don't really need that NVMe, you can get away with a much less expensive SATA SSD, but right now, if you're shopping for an, an SSD or a system drive in general, General. Right now, I'm just using PC Part Picker to look at one terabyte SSDs. It's awesome, you can get SATA SSDs for less than 100 bucks. You have $90 one terabyte SATA SSDs, which is real nice. For a games storage drive or something like that, that would be great. But look, for just five bucks more, you can get an Intel 660p series, not the fastest NVMe SSD, but still significantly faster than a SATA drive. Or you can even find something like a Crucial P1, or if you go further, further down, you can find some drives from Team or Mushkin that are full-fledged NVMe SSDs. They're not gonna be the fastest ones that get you up to 2,500 or 3,000 megabytes per second read and write speeds, but they'll still get you to 1500 to 2000, which is two to three times as fast as a SATA SSD. So if you're doing lots of reads and writes for copying video or something like that, then definitely potentially worth your while to look into the prices of the NVMe SSDs because for a price difference of five, 10 or $15, uh, for a lot of people, I think that actually is worth it. But of course, if those benefits in areas such as faster boot times or faster uh, heavy sequential read and write times don't feel like they're gonna do much for you, then uh, you know, save 10 bucks or so and go with one of these really well-priced SATA SSDs. Just a few questions left here. This one from Coalition Gaming. Uh, hey, I have a question for the next one. When is the next fan meetup? Coalition Gaming, longtime follower. I've met him several times. Usually, and we're still planning on doing this, around November, December, Kyle and I do a game, a charity live stream, and we've also been doing a fan meetup uh, local here in Southern California. We are still planning on doing those this year. We don't have the dates set up exactly yet, uh, so keep an eye on our Twitter, but probably beginning of December or end of November is when we're gonna be doing those things. So keep an eye out for when we actually nail down the dates for those, but we are currently planning on doing them. So uh, I look forward to it. Those, those have been fun in the last years. Next question from Sir Nicholas. There's been so many probing Pauls that my predictive text now, now shows that I wanna type Paul anytime I type probe or probing. Um, this isn't really a question, but just uh, Sir Nicholas, I wanted, I wanted to point out that uh, I, I have that problem too. Associating my name with probing is one of my long-term goals, I guess, for this segment. <laughs> I don't know what else to add to that. And then one last question here from Sword Dust. Uh, hey Paul, I met you at the fan meetup in San Diego a few years back. Oh, hey, thanks, thanks. I hope you're doing well since then. Uh, glad you're still watching my videos. The question, and maybe this is a follow-up to last month's uh, question about uh, Filipino foods that I like, uh, which there are many of. He's asking about the other end of the spectrum. Have you tried balut yet? And and why do you think it's amazing? You're trying to put words in my mouth here, but a quick word of warning, I'm about to show you guys balut. Not close-up pictures, but some people maybe aren't going to like it. Balut is a Filipino delicacy, I want to say, uh, which is basically like an egg that's kind of halfway between a hard-boiled egg and a fully formed chicken. They they let the chick actually get most of the way towards being a chick, and then they cook it in some way, and I think there's some salt involved and maybe some soy sauce, and it's horrible. It's a, it's a really horrible thing. Um, I have tried it. Tried it on one of my first trips to the Philippines. It was in a real idyllic location. It was like sunset on Boracay. We were there on the beach and having a drink, and a dude came along with this styrofoam thing and he's like, balut, balut, balut. And my wife was like, oh, you gotta try it. So I was like, okay. And I took a bite and now I've tried balut and I'm probably never gonna have it again because it really, really did not taste good. But 
I can one-up you. There's something I've tried in the Filipino food range that I liked even less than Balut, and that's this. It's called Bagaong, which is Filipino shrimp paste, and it is horrible. It is abs- like, I already don't like really fishy seafoody stuff, but if you ever are offered Bagaong, turn it down. That's my advice to you. Not good. Not good at all for anything in the world. I'm not sure why it's a thing. But uh, anyway, those are the Filipino foods that I, I don't like, I guess. Uh, most of the other stuff I've tried, I really do like. Uh, Filipino food has a lot of really cool flavors in there. But guys, that is going to wrap it up for episode 40 of Probing Paul. Thank you so much for watching. And of course, if you have any questions that you want me to answer next month, leave them down in the comment section below. While you're down there, if you want to hit the thumbs up two button, uh, thumbs up button two, I always appreciate that. Thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.